Good morning and welcome to episode three of our Sustainable Fire Door Manufacturers webinar series. This is aimed at helping door manufacturers uh, sustain, be sustainable through um, turbulent times. This is the, this is the last episode where we're going to look at the critical topic of cash flow and maximizing financial opportunity. And, and this is to help the, the cause of sustainable life safety, fire life safety. And um, just before we start, I just want you to picture yourself as a company. So a door manufacturer in three months time, and you've got these, um, this vision, the, these goals, maybe the, that three acre plot of land suddenly comes on the market at the side of your factory. You picture yourself, that opportunity there, um, <clears throat> maybe opportunity to go into a, a joint venture with another business, and uh, maybe to acquire a business that comes up for sale in, in fire door manufacturing, maybe some, some offer on some capital equipment, maybe um, a key member of staff is, is headhunted and you want to retain them to protect your business and, and protect the the longevity of the, you know, the supply chain, the key employee, and you want to give them a wage rise. And that feeling in three months time to just be, to, to have the cash, to have the, um, that opportunity to be able to grasp it. So <clears throat> we've got some really excited to have some learned and experienced keynote speakers with us today on this, on this episode. And the first, uh, first speaker is Chris Todd of Drum and Lorry Accountants. Good morning, Chris. I understand you're a Good morning. expert. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good to have you on. I understand you're an expert in tax, particularly VAT. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Chris Todd, um, obviously from Drum and Lorry. Um, my main role in, within the business is, is outsourcing manager. So within our outsourcing team, we really help our clients with their day-to-day -day finance function and either help with it or take it on. Um, so yes, um, that is one of the, the kind of day-to-day -day issues that we deal with quite, quite regularly, along with other things like management accounts and um, general HMRC queries. Very good. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. And look forward to hearing from you. And David Wheeler is our next speaker. Good morning, David. Good morning, Neil. Nice to see you. Nice to hear from you. Oh, thanks, um, Kian. Yeah, David Wheeler from, from Drummond Lorry Accountants. We're, we're based in central Scotland. We've got clients throughout the UK. Our, our clients typically are, are owner-managed businesses, family businesses. Um, so we're used to dealing with the type of issues that those type of businesses uh, encounter. And as Chris says, we, we provide a host of uh, services to these clients all the routine things you would expect from a from a chartered accountants but I, I would like to think we put more more emphasis on looking forward the way than back the way so you know a big part of today's presentation will be about trying to manage cash flow and predict cash flow so that probably ties in quite well with the the emphasis that we put on that within our own practice here it does it does very good i like that looking forward so i guess is it quite a busy time for you guys in tax advice that when there's um, changes in Westminster, like chancellors coming and going, going and coming? Well, it looks like it, it looks like there may be some changes ahead, and we've, we'll we'll find out over the next over the next week or so, I guess, who who's likely to be our new prime minister. But of the eight candidates, as I understand it, seven of them are, are standing on manifestos of. Uh, immediate tax reductions, so that could be that could be good news for for uh, for the participants today and for business in general. If if one of those seven gets elected, Rishi Sunak's the outlier who, I suppose, is the incumbent chancellor and, until last week at least. He's he set the the current course, so he'll be he'll be a bit um, a bit more than likely to to make any big changes. But I, I suppose the two things that business could look look forward to, hopefully. In the coming uh, in the in the coming months is a reversal of the, the planned corporation tax increase, which is due to come into force next April. 
Interesting. Um, at the moment, corporation tax is 19% of profits. It's scheduled to go up to 25% next April, so a significant rise. Right. Now, I think all of these seven candidates, other than Sunak, have committed to postponing the, the increase, and, and at least one or two of them have committed to starting to reduce corporation tax in a bid to attract more business and more investment into the UK from, from yep. elsewhere where tax rates are higher. Um, so there's that. There's also the employ the national insurance increases, which come into force only in April. And that, you know, that as well as impacting on the individuals and the, the employees, that, that's quite a big impact on employers as well, because the employers' national insurance increased at that stage by one and a quarter percent. So that's essentially added to the cost base of all the all the businesses and participants that are on, on here today. So we might see we might see one or both of those things being reversed, I suspect, if anyone other than Sunak is elected in the coming coming couple of months. That's very interesting. <clears throat> it's, it's good to get um, <clears throat> look at impact, potential impact ahead of the time and be up front with it as soon as it happens. Um, it just reminds me of a, just quickly of a story and then we'll get on with our subject, but we were in business in the early 2001 um, and we chose a, an accountancy company that was low cost. Um, we chose this accountant anyway, they were above a grocer shop. And after three years of trading, we were in contracting, rental and maintenance. Um, we were advised by a business advisor to get monthly accurate management accounts and ask your accountant for them. So we went to the accountant and said, could we have these monthly accurate business accounts? And his answer was, I don't see the point. And we drilled in a bit and he was um, dealing, 90% of his customers were fruit and veg and hairdressers taking cash over the till. Um, quite different to our business model. So I, the only reason I say that is now is a time to make sure that your advice is in a line with your business model and make sure that you're up to date um, as to all companies, but fire door manufacturers, are we prepared for what's ahead? So over to you, Chris, look forward to um, helping us on cash flow. Cash is king. Yep. Thank you, Neil. Okay, so I'm going to start off today, and like like I mentioned, a bit a big part of my day-to-day -day task is on on VAT treatment, um, and the, the first thing which really we have seen a benefit over the last couple of years, and Brexit really is, is on the on the the benefit we can get from the import VAT. Now I'm, I'm aware this doesn't always apply to everybody, or that you might already be doing this, but I thought it's, it's a very good point to um, re-emphasise if, if you're not aware of it already. Okay. So from Brexit, um, to make the, the treatment of import VAT and make it a lot more streamlined when it comes to customs, the government introduced a, a VAT treatment called postponed VAT accounting. Now, in simple terms, what this does is it, it takes away the need for you to pay the VAT, the import VAT up front at point of delivery and basically account for it on your next VAT, import, um, VAT return. Okay. The, this obviously does have some significant cash flow benefits, which we'll, we'll go on to in later slides. Um, and it, something that everybody isn't always aware of, it, is, uh, it can apply to everybody. Everybody's automatically entitled to use postponed fat accounting, although it's not the automatic um, first port, port of, it's not automatically applied by HMRC or in the couriers. So what is postponed VAT? So like I alluded to before, it is a, a method of paying the import VAT on your next VAT return rather than having to pay it at point of entry into the UK and then having to recover that import VAT on your next VAT return. What you do is you declare and recover the import VAT on the same VAT return. And really as a, as a fairly straight, there's different methods to do it, but the, in, in essence, what you're doing is in putting it in box one and box four in your VAT return, which will effectively offset it. HMRC maintain monthly postponed VAT statements, which you can register to receive. And these are the statements that you use to, to populate the VAT return on a monthly or quarterly basis. 
Um, one point to, to emphasize here though is that um, that the import VAT, postponed VAT treatment isn't a saving of import VAT, it's purely a, a cash flow benefit. It postpones, as, as the name suggests, it postpones the payment of the import VAT um, for you. So we'll take a, a couple of examples here for the cash flow benefit. Okay, so the standard method um, of import VAT when you're bringing goods into the country is obviously, assuming that there was no deferment account, is the goods would be received into the country. So for instance, in this, the goods could be received on the 1st of January. Now the import VAT is charged on these goods at the point they, they come into the country. And then that is paid, that should be paid immediately. Unless you pay that, the goods will not be released from customs. So you have to pay out that cash to get the goods released. Okay. In this instance, if we say that the, the business had a, a March VAT return, it would be lodged in the end of April, it would be lodged by the 7th of May. You can see there that the, the, the cash flow that you're going to have, you're basically paying out the cash on this import about four months um, in advance of when you're actually being able to reclaim it. Okay. <clears throat> With postponed VAT treatment now, the same, the same treatment, the goods would still be rece received on the 1st of January. The, the import VAT is still charged on these goods and it is still due to be paid. But if you declare it on your, on your customs declarations that you have to use postponed VAT, the goods will be released. No payment will have to be made. HMRC will put that uh, import VAT onto your postponed VAT statement. And that what you do is you will you will then declare pay effectively pay the import VAT and recover the import VAT on your next VAT return, which would be March, lodged the seventh of May. So you can see there that the, the cash impact on 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 using postponed VAT is, is neutral, um, rather than being basically out of pocket for up to four months before you're having to reclaim it. How to use postponed VAT? Like I said before, it is available to everybody who is VAT registered in the UK. Um, it's not automatically applied by HMRC, um, probably for obvious reasons for, 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 their, for them collecting the VAT. Um, you must state on your customs declaration that you wish to use postponed VAT or they will def defer, default back to the standard, the standard system. Um, you... I, I'm, what we see is the likelihood of most of our clients at the moment, they, they get their customs agent. So they have a, 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 an agent who deal with preparing their customs declarations, bringing the goods into the country. What we would suggest is you contact your customs agents, your couriers, ensure that they are aware that you wish to use postponed VAT accounting and get written confirmation from them that they, they've taken your instruction. Um, what they then do is when on the customs declarations, it's a, they, they declare that it's to be used, postponed fact to be used. After that, you register with HMRC online, that you can find the link online fa fairly easily. It's a, it's a standard, straightforward registration using your government gateway access. And that just then gives you access to online statements. So every time something comes into the country and you use postponed fact, HMRC add it to your postponed VAT statement. Something similar to how you might see the C79 certificates happening just now. And then the actual working of the postponed VAT on your VAT return is that every time you prepare your VAT return, you would then go into your online postponed VAT statements, get the figures for each month and enter it onto your VAT return in boxes one and four. Effectively, like I said, offsetting the payment of the import VAT with the reclaim of the import VAT. Okay, so some points to note on, on postponed VAT, however. Okay, uh, postponed VAT, as it probably says in the name, only applies to import VAT. It doesn't apply to any duty charges that may be applied to the goods that you're bringing into the country. Duty charges still have, will be still incurred at the point of entry and they still will have to be paid in order to get the goods released from customs. Okay. Previously, you may have heard or may have them as deferment accounts, where that allow, a deferment account allows you to, 
to bring many shipments in in a month and pay it month pay a one off um, figure monthly. If you still have a deferment account or you want to set a deferment account up, you can obviously use this deferment account purely for the duty charges and not for the VAT. What we do see more often happening now, though, um, and this is dependent on how the, the value of any duty charges coming in, is that the customs agents are usually now willing to use their own deferment accounts to defer the duty charges and release the goods quickly from customs. Now, they usually do this for you for a minimum charge, but in our experience, that is usually a lot more beneficial than trying to um, having to pay up front, okay, or setting up the deferment account. What we can, uh, another point is to stress the point that the postponed VAT doesn't save import VAT, it doesn't differ, the, uh, let the value differ. It really is just a, a, a way of moving the payment further down the line and matching it off with when you're being able to reclaim it. The, and the final thing is, that postponed VAT and standard import VAT treatment can be it can be combined. Okay, so if, for instance, you missed a courier and didn't advise them to be postponed VAT, there's not to worry. It, it would just default back to the the standard um, way of doing it. It would go onto your C seventy nine, but you would have obviously have to pay that up front. So hopefully that gives you a, a kind of quick up briefing on, on what is involved in postponed VAT. And uh, you can quite clearly see the benefits that it can, it can take, it can give you in, in terms of cash flow. Okay. The next way, next slide we're going to move on to is obviously working capital. Okay. So what we find is most people when they're looking to generate cash, the automatic response is to look externally. Okay, whether that be to banks. Um, for loans, overdrafts, etc. But what you can find and what you probably will be aware of is these kind of arrangements can be very time consuming, can take a while to get it organised, and also it can be very costly. Okay, so what we would suggest is before you look externally is to look internally and look at your own working processes um, and working capital management to try and and see how you can improve that to generate the cash that you require. Now, the three main areas that we, we have got control of, um, of, some, of some degree that we can look to improve, are in stock, trade debtors, and trade creditors. So for instance, in stock, um, we could look to set minimum, maximum stock levels um, based on prior or expected usage. Now, David will come on to this in a little bit later on and, and the benefits of forecasting and budgets. But this is where one area where that really does have a, a huge impact and a benefit to you. If, if you can forecast and budget what your expected trade stock levels are likely to be. Um, identify, you could identify suppliers with shorter lead times, possibly located closer to you. That when you, obviously you then don't have to hold as much stock to be able to supply that to your customers on a timely basis as and when you're able to get it in a lot quicker. Um, and also maybe another option to, to improve your stock um, holding is to look for opportunities to take consignment stock from suppliers. So that'll be a case where you have you have the stock, but you, you, you don't physically pay for that stock until you've sold it to your customers. So you, you're, you're getting, you're incurring the cost and paying for it as and when that stock is used. That's good, Chris. I just um, just bring in here that this is linking us back to episode one of this series, uh, where we looked at lean and visual management. And there's an excellent program available to all door manufacturers to look at um, lean management. Again, you may already have it, but um, in the in the current situation, the current circumstances we find ourselves in globally. Um, lean and visual management is a great aid to those three points that we can see there on um, stock levels, expected usage, um, shorter lead times, and just looking at lead times. Um, one concern is going around door manufacturers is 
huge amounts of stock of certain components um, to sort of combat the the turbulence we've had in supply chain over the past couple of years and um, how that's impacting cash flow so it's, it's a it's very appropriate what you're saying there chris mm. yeah over the obviously the last most recently there, there has been a, a like, like you say it's been a a turbulent time um and we have seen delays and and lead times coming across um but let's say hopefully a lot of this will be down to, to budget and forecast, which we'll come on to later. Um, and just having a, a, a good expectation of what you are actually needing and when you will require it. Good. I'll just say that episode one recording, episode one and two are on the events page of our website. It's in the Rutland events. That's a good deal. Thank you. Um, the, the other area, another area is trade data. So obviously, it's your debtors day so um, what you're trying to do here is obviously we're saying here to try and reduce your debtor day so that is that you're trying to reduce the amount of time that your customers take to pay you okay you're obviously turning your debtors into cash try to get that in quicker okay now the, the obvious ways to do that is obviously to review and tighten your credit control procedures so that is whether you have somebody who's dedicated to credit control or somebody within your team that has some time usually within a within their weekly or normal normal task to, to dedicate some time to credit control um, you can as part of that the best way we find is to make sure that you you're sending regular statements out you're sending them out to customers promptly at the start of each month because really what we do see is a lot of customers don't you don't actually pay on invoice they they wait for the statement to come out and pay on statement so the quicker you can get the, these statements out to them the the, the the quicker hopefully they will pay um, on those statements yeah. and other process in terms of uh, just the credit control process is is to con have a good communication with your, your customers so contact them regularly um, what we would there's a technique called the Dunning technique, which suggests that two weeks prior to your due date of any invoices, that you you would call your your suppliers, make sure that they're happy with the invoices, they've got the invoices, there's no queries on it, they've been approved for payment, and at that point you can in any queries, any problems, you can tie them up. What we find is that, that there is quite a, a it, quite a large evidence to say that people who do follow that method do get their get their, their debtors in their customers do pay them a lot quicker than those who don't follow that method okay um like i say there's there's other ways of of getting um money in but the main thing with with your credit control process is have that communication with your customers contact them early and but another thing is to be very consistent with your approach be regular be consistent don't let it fall fall by the wayside and be consistent across all your customers. Uh, what we would suggest is obviously is you, you spend some time, whether it weekly, um, some time that you dedicate to credit control and do all these techniques, call the customer, send statements out, um, identify any problems. Okay, but consistency is key when it comes to credit control. Okay. The other area we can you can also look at is creditors. So the, the time it takes you to pay your suppliers and of, obviously you you want to try and extend that period of time to help your cash flow as much as you can now the best way to do that is obviously through negotiating with your your suppliers for extended credit terms what i would say that is i wouldn't we wouldn't advise you just take extra or extend the credit terms without negotiation and without the agreement of your suppliers because as you might be aware that that can obviously cause problems with the supplier. So obviously have that in agreement. Um, the things you can use to within those in, uh, negotiations would be to maybe offer to provide order forecasts for the coming year. Um, that obviously helps your supplier and their buying when they need to buy the goods in. Um, again, forecasting is key to this. So we'll, David will discuss in, future, in later slides. 
If you've got good forecasting tools, it will help with your negotiation with suppliers. Um, offer, again, with forecasting, you can offer um, what you're expecting to buy in the coming year. It gives them some assurance that you are going to come back to them, you're going to place orders and some assurance of what level of orders. And also guarantee supplier minimum order quantities. So um, if you can see that, that you need a certain amount by a certain time um, and you've, you've got good forecasting tools, you can order larger amounts for your suppliers. It obviously helps. Um, it obviously helps you with your, your stock control, but obviously gives your, your suppliers some confidence that you're, and you're going to be getting, bringing in bigger orders and they can plan when they are going to order the goods for you um, and obviously reduce the handling time, dispatch costs if they're bringing in fewer um, containers or shipments or, or, or orders in, in to, to meet your order. Okay, now next slide, what we'll do is obviously we've seen here we, sorry, if I just go back to the next slide, the last slide, so we, at the top here, increase, if, if, if everything, all these three areas were to be worked on, okay, and we're looking at here, if we took, could increase our stock turn from four to five, and what we mean by increase stock turn from four to five by using these um, processes would be that you turn your stock around within the year five times rather than four times. Obviously, you're getting your stock in and you're putting it out to your customers quicker. Okay, um, reducing your debtor days from 58 to 52. What that would say is obviously your, your customers are taking up to on average six days um, quicker, they're, they're paying you six days quicker than what you would than what they were before. And in an extended payment terms from 30 to 40, that's you paying your suppliers up to 10 days, taking long, 10 days longer to pay your suppliers. Okay, now if these movements were to be met. This is a, a, a snapshot of a, a snapshot of what you could expect, okay, um, and what could happen with the cash generation here. Okay, on the left hand side and now is how how your your balance sheet here would look as if you were trading normally as you were. On the right hand side here is if if you could meet these planned targets. How your, how your balance sheet may look on the right hand side. Now, these improvements in working capital would it would have an impact on, on your profit, or as you can see here on your net asset, your balance sheet position, it, they both come out. What it does do is it, it generates cash from these the stock debtors, credit balances, it turns them into cash quicker. And you can see here what, or from the right hand side, you can see here that your stock holding allows you have a, a lower stock holding. Your trade debtors are obviously coming down from 400,000 to 360 because you're getting that money in quicker. Your creditors are going up from 150 to 190. You're extending that credit terms. You're not paying your suppliers as quickly as you were. But the main bit of what is highlighted here is your, 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 your cash facility that we can see we've got an improvement there of 130,000 pounds possibility if, if you could meet those targets. Obviously, um, what can what is achievable and not achievable is, is different between business and business. But you can hopefully you can see there that by looking internally, looking at your own internal processes and working capital, that you can achieve a good generate cash, achieve, achieve good cash generation without having to go externally. Um, and then, so I think now we can maybe pass on to David. It'll take us on to the budget and then forecasting. Thanks, Chris. That's excellent. Okay, thank, thanks for that, Chris. I'll, I'll take on for the next the next few slides. Um, we touched earlier a little bit on what might happen in the next in the coming months or the coming years as far as tax goes. But what we do know is that over um, the last 25 years or so, the UK has developed a very complex and a very fast-changing tax landscape under succession the chancellors and prime ministers. Um, that's, we've got a much more complex tax legislation and landscape than, than any other developed country. Um, and it's unfortunate for businesses such as the ones that are on here today that that's, that's happened. It's probably quite fortunate for businesses like ours because it, it means people have to turn to accountants and tax advisors for probably for more advice than they should do. 
So because it is a complex tax landscape, it is very important that your tax advisor and, and your or your accountants keeping you abreast of what's changing. And most importantly, how that how those changes impact on you and your business and what actions you can take to remain tax efficient. Today, we're, we're just going to look at one very small aspect of tax, and that's looking at the uh, tax incentives available on capital investment. And these are typically referred to as capital allowances. The standard rate of capital allowance is 18%. That's changed a bit, has reduced a bit over the years. But for as many years as I can remember, the government have put in place um, incentives to, to, to try and attract business to, to make capital investment. And the, these, these have typically been known as first year allowances or annual investment allowances over the years. And at the moment, the annual investment allowance is that you can spend up to a million pounds on certain what they term plant and machinery, and I'll come on to that shortly, um, which attracts 100% tax relief. In other words, you can offset up to a million pounds of capital expenditure against your taxable profits in that tax year, and you'll get the relief advanced. And what, what that really is, is an acceleration of the tax relief. So that, rather than getting it at 18% every year, you got 100% of the tax relief in year one. So it's accelerating the tax relief. What changed in April 2021 was the introduction of what's known as a corporation tax super deduction. And this is, this is more than an acceleration of relief. This is enhancing the relief that businesses get for investing in the business. So rather than getting 100% of the value of the, the investment you make deducted against your profits, you got 130% deducted so it's an actual enhancement it's really it's taking the relief that you get from 19 percent of your of the money spent to almost 25 percent the money spent so it is a genuine uh, a genuine uh, enhancement that the government have put in place just now so how do you qualify to claim the corporation tax super deduction well i've referred a couple of times in that slide to, to plant and machinery and that's a, a term that the government use hmrc use which is not really very helpful um, description because it, I don't think it really gives most people an indication of what, what it includes. To most people, when you talk about plant and machinery, it's, you're probably envisaging factories and uh, foundries and such like. In fact, the terminology includes things like uh, commercial vehicles, IT equipment, office furniture. There's a list here. It's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a, a flavour of what's covered by plant and machinery. So the corporation tax super deduction would apply to anything that's on that on that list, and you would get one hundred and thirty percent of the of the uh, investment to be able to offset against your taxable profits. But what conditions sit around about um, the super deduction? There's probably three main things that, I, that I'd like to to highlight to you before just giving a couple of examples to finish on. And the first one is very specific to this to this relief, this super deduction, the asset that you buy must be new. In other words, if you buy something secondhand or used equipment, it does not qualify. So it needs to be, the item in hand needs to be new. So if it's a new van, if it's a van, it needs to be a new van. If it's a piece of equipment for your, for your, um, for your workshop, it needs to be a new piece of equipment. Second thing is, is the asset must be bought. In other words, the title must pass from the seller to you, to your business. It can't be on finance lease. It can't be an operating lease. You can't hire it. It needs to be bought. Just to be clear on that, when I say bought, it can either be bought outright for cash or it can be bought on higher purchase with the title, under a higher purchase agreement, the title will pass from the seller to, to you at that point. Uh, that's different under the finance lease or an operating lease. Uh, and the final thing to highlight is, is, at the moment, this incentive is due to end on the 31st of March. 2023, so next, the end of next March. So that's not too far away. It's less than nine months, less than nine months now, but it gives you a window of opportunity to, to spend money on your business between now and then, knowing that you're going to get this additional incentive. Now, it may be that the, the incoming chancellor, whoever that may, may be, um, extends it or enhances it or does something different, but at the moment, that's that's all we know. So just to give a couple of examples of what this actually means and in, in, Per notes terms, if a business incurs a million pound of capital expenditure, and at the moment the limit on the annual investment allowance, which is the default position before the super deduction is a million pounds. So in, in a year without the super deduction, it would save the company 
19% of the million, so 190,000. With the super deduction, and you get the extension of the 130%, your company will save 247,000. So 247 V190, a clear tax saving there. And that's an enhancement. It's not a timing benefit, it's an enhancement. The second example highlights the fact that the, the super deduction is unlimited. So whereas the annual investment allowance is limited to a million pounds a year, the super deduction is unlimited. So that gives opportunities for bigger companies mostly to spend a lot, a lot of money, invest a lot of money in the business and get huge tax savings at the moment. So the example here of a company incurs 10 million pounds of qualifying expenditure at the moment with the, with the rules and the annual investment allowance, which are limited to a million, the company would save just under half a million pounds in tax. Using the super deduction, that goes up to almost two and a half million pounds saving in tax. So the more, essentially, the more you spend uh, at the moment with the super deduction, the bigger your savings going to be, and it's an untapped benefit. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Thank you, David. So again, I would just say, you know, on, on this one, watch this space and ensure your accountant keeps you updated on how the coming changes will affect you and make sure that you make the most of this window of opportunity with the super deduction in the coming nine months. So we'll move on now away from, away from tax and we'll talk about the importance of managing cash flow. Now, in Neil's introduction, he gave a few example scenarios um, where you where you might need cash in a few months' time. You know, the, the, the three acres of land next door to, you, to your, your premises, a, a joint venture opportunity, perhaps needing to enhance your key staff salaries to keep to retain them. I'll give you a few other scenarios just now, and then we'll, and this will hopefully highlight the importance of being able to manage your cash flow. Um, and, and these augment the examples that Neil's given. So, you know, Chris alluded earlier on to, to supply chain issues, and we've certainly had probably the biggest challenges that our clients have, have faced since, um, I don't know if it was, whether it's since Brexit or since COVID, they both happened right about the same time, but over that last two year period, supply chain has been probably been the biggest issue that most of our, uh, most of our clients have, have faced. So scenario here, your buyer, your buyer, your in-house buyer informs you that your main suppliers run out of stock. Your buyer sourced an alternative supplier, however, you don't have credit, a credit account with them, so you need to pay on pro forma. It's a material amount of money, but you badly need the stock. So you're going to need to find some cash quickly for, for that. That's probably unpredictable. The next one's more predictable, and you really should have systems in place so that this doesn't come as a, a surprise, but your finance manager reminds you that there's a VAT bill to be paid at the end of this month, and it's also the month when your corporation tax is due to be paid, so you've got a double whammy come up at the end of this month more cash requirement. Back to your supply chain again. And again, this is something we've seen probably more regularly in the, in the last year or so, where suppliers have notified clients that there's going to be a price increase at a future date. So you've then got a window of opportunity to buy stock now at the current prices, hopefully protect your margins and help to, help to make more money in the future than you otherwise would have done. However, again, this would result in you increasing your stock holding, which was required to be paid for now. So there's a cash demand to take that opportunity. And then the final, the final example here, and again, you know, we in the first quarter of 2022, the rate of business failures has risen sharply from the same quarter last year. And this might, we think this might become more common now um, in, the, in the coming quarters that lie ahead. So your credit controller notifies you that one of your biggest customers is unexpectedly been placed into liquidation. There's unlikely to be any payout to creditors, so you're not going to get your money. The debt's not insured, and you've drawn against it on your invoice discounting facility, so it's going to effectively reduce your ability to draw money on that facility for the for the foreseeable future. So these are just a few scenarios which could occur in your business, and Neil, Neil gave a few other scenarios earlier, but if you... If you don't have systems in place to allow you to easily and quickly assess the impact of these type of scenarios on your business, then it's very difficult to make decisions. It's rather like trying to find your way around in the dark. It's, it's almost stating the obvious to say, but it's really vital that you have a system in place 
that allows you to manage your cash flow and that allows you to know what to do in any of these type of scenarios that we've highlighted today. Okay, so we'll go on now and we'll talk about what you can do to hopefully put those type of systems in place. I think the, the first thing to say here, and I always discuss this with our, with our clients, is it's very important to have an expectation of what you think is going to happen in your business. Otherwise, how do you know if you're going along on the right track or not? And for some people, this, this could just be an informal idea that you've got in your head um, of where you think you're going. We would suggest that a more formal approach is an excellent discipline to adopt in your business. And we've probably all heard the saying, failure, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. A big part of a business's preparation should be, in our, in our view, should be to continuously look ahead. And I talked earlier about the importance of looking ahead in business rather than looking back. So continuously looking ahead and setting budgets for the coming 12 months and beyond that. And for good businesses, this will comprise, you know, profit and loss budgets, balance sheet budgets, cash flow, funds flow budgets. And you, these should be reviewed on a regular basis. In other words, if you set a budget today for the next 12 months, it's very unlikely in six months' time that, that you're still going to have the same view as to what lies ahead. Things change, and it's important you update these budgets and these forecasts. Ideally, you'll, you'll involve the senior people in your business, and they'll have contributed to the setting of these budgets, and you'll get the buy-in from them from the start. So that, that's opposed to the business owner or the MD imposing a budget on his team and just demanding that they meet it. You, in my experience, you don't always get the buy-in of the key people if you, if you do it in, in that way, but better to involve them from the start. I think, I think you also, it's also critical that you measure, you've got a, a way to measure your actual performance against budget on a monthly basis, quarterly at the outside, understanding any variances and taking corrective action where, where necessary. So hopefully, Everyone that's on today will have a, 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 the ability to produce up-to-date monthly or quarterly management accounts, which will allow you to make this comparison of actual performance against budgeted performance and see where action and corrective action may be required at any moment in time. That's good, that, David. Could we, just on that point, could we just have a maybe have a poll um, just to see where um, how many people have up-to-date, accurate monthly and quarterly uh, management accounts? a little poll up there just give it five seconds five or ten seconds just while we're waiting there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the zoom call so please be free to put in any questions we'll try and answer at the end there's quite a number of questions come through already she's good Yes, that's good, 100%. <laughs> very good. That's very good. And that gives you a bit of comfort. <clears throat> yeah. And gives us a bit of comfort that the businesses uh, on today have got a good handle on their, on their current financial position and hopefully yeah. the, the forward position as well. So that's that's excellent. Good. Maybe just coming back to, the, to that slide again, Neil, if we're able to do that. There you go. Okay. So, again, it's not... It's not easy, necessarily easy to produce budgets in this way, but if you are, it's really, it's really helpful if you've got the ability to sensitise these budgets. You know, none of us have got a crystal ball, so we don't know what, what lies ahead of us. So sometimes, sometimes it's helpful to be able to say, well, what, ha what if? That's the, that's the question to ask, what if? So what if my margin's not 30%? What if it's only 27%? Or what if, my, what if I don't reach my sales target this year and I, and I fall 5% short? Or what if? There's issues with my supply chain and I need to hold more stock. Or what if my customers don't pay me in 60 days, they, they pay me in 65 days? How does all these things impact on your, on your cash flow and your budgets? So it's really important that if you've got a model, a cash flow model, you're able to sensitize it very easily and very quickly to see the impact of those different type of things that, can, that will happen. You know, and it gives you a bit of peace of mind if you, if you know that your business can withstand some knocks, 
such as the ones I've just described. Hopefully they don't happen, but it might let you sleep a bit easier at night if you know your business can withstand it if it does happen. That's good. Good word, sensitise. Yeah. The, the, other, the other thing that I think that most business, or all businesses should know, not all businesses do, but good ones will, is what is your break-even? How much business do you need to do to break even? And remember, every time that you increase your overhead, this increases. And in my experience, the well-organized and well-motivated businesses, once they know what their break-even is, they then have a almost like a race every month to see how early in that month they can pass their break-even point. And then obviously everything they earned after that is profit. But again, it just gives you peace of mind if you know what you're aiming for and you know when you pass that break-even and when you're getting towards it and you can hopefully breathe a bit easily, more easily after that. Um, just a, a couple of other points to, to finish on with, with this slide. You know, a lot of businesses who have got bank borrowing will have financial covenants in their in the funding agreements, and you know, failure to meet those financial covenants can right, result in the right of the lender, the bank, to demand immediate repayment of the loan. So, if you've got budgets and forecasts in place, it should allow you to see coming down the road any issues that may be coming in terms of meeting those bank covenants, and then giving you the ability to take corrective action before it becomes a problem and before the bank have got the opportunity to, to put a bit of squeeze on you. So again, just another benefit having the having, having the budgets. And then I think just the, the, the final point at the bottom, I'm conscious of time, the final point at the bottom is that people often associate failing businesses with, with lack of cash. That's not always the case and it's often not the case. Growth demands cash. So growing businesses are often the ones that run out of cash. You know, why, why would that be? Well, growing businesses need more stock. They'll have more money lying out with their customers. They'll be recruiting more staff. They'll, they may have to fit out new premises, et cetera. All of those things demand cash. So it's nice to sit down with your sales team and say, right, we're going to, we're going to go for major growth next year. You need to know and have the confidence that your business can actually afford, can actually afford to, that growth. So just to finish on, how do, we, how do you actually construct a cash flow forecast? Well, obviously the, the cash flow is underpinned. Do I go another way? Yeah, cash flow is underpinned by trading performance. So in other words, over a long period of time, if you trade successfully and profitably, then your cash flow will reflect this. However, in the shorter term, there's lots of other factors which impact your cash flow and which should be considered carefully when preparing your forecast, and I would suggest conservatively. You know, and some of these are things that Chris covered earlier on when he was talking about uh, squeezing money out of your working capital. So how quickly do customers pay you? How quickly do you pay suppliers? How much stock do you hold? How much capex do you expect to incur in the next, in the next budget period? How much dividends or drawings do the business owners need to take in that period? What rate of tax are you paying and when do you have to pay your tax? These are all things that clearly have an impact and in the short term can have a major impact on cash flow. So it's important that you that you consider these carefully. And as I say, when preparing your cash flow statement, um, that you maybe take a conservative view in those. So you know, some of these factors you can influence, how much stock you hold, maybe how quickly you pay suppliers, et cetera. And some you can't influence. But what that tells us is that if you can influence these factors, you can influence your cash flow as well. Um, and as I said, some of these come back to, to to what Chris spoke earlier on about managing your working capital well. A robust cash flow model will demonstrate to you the impact that such measures will have in your business. And so again, it's an extremely valuable tool, tool to possess. And I'm pleased to see that the businesses today that have got the uh, up-to-date management accounts in place, and hopefully they're, they're looking forward as well as back the way, and that they've got a good, robust form of budget and forecasting in place to, to manage your business with. So thank you. Thank you, David. It's excellent. <clears throat> yeah, if we just, um, could you just give us some sort of key action points between you? Um, that you know, it's like key takeaways. We will, we will just have some um, a Q and A session um, at this point. But if anyone wanted to move on, um, we 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 understand that. Um, but there is some very interesting questions that we'd like to take. No, thanks, Neil. I think 
really from from what we've discussed um, today, um, the main points I think people should hopefully try and take out of it is um, elect to use postponed VAT now. I think it's a very beneficial tool um, if it applies to you, and hopefully we've demonstrated the benefits to your cash flow that way. Maximise the benefit you get from corporation tax super deduction, and David explained um, what that was about and how to do it. Um, squeeze your own working capital to get any cash before seeking external bank funding. Again, look internally, look at your own processes before automatically going externally um, and try and generate the cash from, from what you can control. And the, the, one of the main, the main points to come out of it is continuously forecast and look forward um, and have, some, have a good control over your business's cash flow. Um, and like I say, really look forward rather than always looking back and continuously update that as, as you go along. That's excellent. Those are the four kind of main areas we should take out of it today. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. And um, we'll just move straight on to these questions, if that's OK. We've just got eight minutes. So the first question here is, as a door manufacturer, we already have solar panels fitted, plenty of office equipment, etc. Would new machinery for manufacturing process qualify for the super deduction? Yeah, I was I would come back on that one, Neil. You know, assuming that the all the other conditions are met. So assuming what it's a limited company we're talking about, assuming it's new equipment and assuming it's been bought outright or bought in a higher purchase, then that, that machinery they will certainly qualify for the corporation tax super deduction. That's good. Thank you, David. The next um, next question here is we manufacture and install fire doors. So that's a manufacturer and installer. Um we're in, so they're in the contracting business too. Where would upfront deposits come into cash flow? Do you mean by that, Neil? Do you mean that that business will receive upfront deposits from it, from its customers? Yes, that's that's how I'm reading it. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, in, in that instance, I think that I think the danger you need to guard against there is, is trading off customers' deposits. You know, again, good businesses would would ring fence deposits and use that money to buy to buy product or goods. Or pay wages for work on that job. Yeah. The danger, you, what you want to guard against is, is using deposits for jobs tomorrow to pay for costs and jobs yesterday or today. Yeah. That's good, sound advice. But this the next question looks like another door manufacturer. Um, I think we may have covered this about profitability, but the same we're a profitable manufacturer. How will watching cash flow help us? Um, I'd just like to add, maybe there, David, um, I've heard it said a profitable manufacturer can go broke through not watching cash flow. Um, is it really that serious? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, it comes back to some of the scenarios that we touched on earlier, Neil, perhaps, perhaps some of the ones that you gave, actually, you know, you could be, you could be trading profitably, you could, be, you could be setting the cash in the bank, but all of a sudden an opportunity comes up for the for the JV or or for some you know a piece of land next to you, next to your existing property, how yeah. do you, how do you know that you've got the how do you know you've got the wherewithal to afford those opportunities? You know it's not it's not good enough just to say well we've got money in the bank today so let's go and spend it. You need to know what lies ahead, yeah. because you know you might have a there might be the example where you've got the VAT and the and the corporation tax due at the end of next month. Have you still got enough money after you've paid those? So I think all businesses really. All good businesses will will have a method of forecasting their cash forward, so they know how much real free cash that they have, and and that will tell them if they're, if they're able to exploit those type of opportunities or not. Brilliant, thank you, David. Um, just Chris mentioned, um, I think earlier the importance of collecting our money and sending statements out earlier, more regularly. Um, can you help more more on this? Because the timber, this this question is the timber trade particularly. Are late payers notoriously. Is there any more creative ways to reduce debtor days? There are there are other areas, but they, well, they obviously differ from from business to business and your relationship with your customers. Um, we say that what like like we said, getting statements out earlier is a very good approach. 
being being in constant communication with your customers um to to to, to request sort out any problems in a prompt in a prompt manner so if there are any queries and invoices that they get sorted before they're, they're due to be paid um and again <clears throat> depending on your relationship with the customers excuse me <clears throat> there are other ways to do it um, or to look at it for instance things like um, offering um, early payment settlement discount um, on the flip side of that charging late, late payment interest but you can obviously see those are those will be dependent on 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 the relationship you've got with your customers and how you want that relationship to move forward but the, the biggest thing for credit control, uh, I really can't emphasize it enough, is, is consistency. Um, if you're consistent in your, pro, your approach, you do the same things regularly, um, that, that you, you will, the, the, the evidence is there that you'll see the benefit and get the money in quicker. That's great. Very good. It's like almost managing expectations. Exactly. Good. The last question here for, um, your word is at the present my business doesn't prepare any formal budgets in the way that david described is this something that i can get my accountant to do for me i'll, I'll come in on that one i'm, I'm sure that is something that <clears throat> that you know the, that your accountant can can do for you most accountants would have the ability to do that however it's very important that the input for those budgets comes from the business itself you know, the accountant can know what you what your targets are for next year and how you intend to develop the business. So it's, it's important that the input for those budgets comes from the business. And as I alluded to earlier, not necessarily just from the business owner, but maybe from the, the key the key people in the business, the sales manager or the ops manager or the buyer. I think yeah. it should be a combined effort from them to produce the, the underlying data. And if you, if you like, pass it to your accountant, then they should be able to put it into the the format along the lines that I discussed and give you back a really good, valuable tool that you can then use to manage cash flow going forward with. That's excellent. Thank you, David. So you're getting buy-in. So, well, that concludes our Q&A session. Let's, um, we just had those key takeaways. Um, just recap on those quickly. Elect to use postponed VAT now. Maximise the benefit you get from the corporation tax super deduction. Squeeze your own working capital to generate cash before seeking external bank funding. Continuously forecast forward and have control over your business cash flow. Well, thank you. Very good. We're, whether you've joined us live today or in the future, people watching catch-up videos on our events page, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>